All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for hanging out for as long as you have. It means a lot. And I'm just as excited to go to lunch, so we're going to get started. Um, <laughs> Over the summer, with the help of my phenomenal research mentors, Sarah Spaulding, Meredith Tyree, and Matt Jokel, who is from Nebraska, he's not on site with us, I reconstructed a Paleo Lake environment during the late Miocene in order to set the foundation for future re uh, research that'll find connections between diatom evolution, development of grasslands, and global climate. So we're going to jump right into some background information so that you guys can really have a solid understanding of what I was looking for. And we're going to start with the big money question, what are diatoms? So diatoms are a type of single-celled algae, as well as the backbone of my entire research project. Um, they're very special. And one of the things that makes them so special is that they're made of silica. And silica is a really hard, durable material. They consist of two silica valves that meet in the middle, so they're really beautiful and symmetrical, kind of the same way that clams are made of two shells that connect in the middle. They are also really important photosynthesizers. Today, they produce up to 40% of the air that we breathe, and they are phenomenal indicators of aquatic health. This is because they're super picky about the type of water that they live in. So if you are looking at fossilized diatoms, it gives, they give you hints as to what their environment looked like when they were existing. They also have the potential to be really effective stratigraphic markers because of the fact that some of them existed for short periods of time through Earth's history. So now that we've talked a little bit about the micro, we're going to zoom out and talk about what was happening globally um, at this time. So during the late Miocene, there was a really dramatic global cooling that happened. This figure uh, shows the entire Cenozoic era, but we're only going to focus on this chunk because the Miocene is along this orange line, and it existed between 23 to 6 million years ago. And if you look at this dotted box, you can see that there is a dramatic decrease in global temperature. This was uh, mostly due to the fact that Antarctica was separating from the rest of the continents at this time, so the Antarctic ice sheets were starting to form and really cool everything off. So while that was happening in the world, in North America, the grasslands were developing because the climate was becoming so arid and dry. And it was suppressing the extension of forests and encouraging the growth of grasslands. And these grasslands really triggered a big boom in coevolution because as the grasses spread, uh, the grazers like horses also spread and evolved to eat the grasses. And the grasses did not want to be munched on. So they started to produce more silica to get themselves harder and more difficult for the horses to chew. And so they're producing more silica and introducing more silica to the environment. And if you remember, diatoms are made of silica. So the more silica there is in the environment, the more building material these diatoms have to create bigger, stronger valves and um, to evolve. So what is happening? Basically, we hypothesized that there is a connection between uh, grasslands developing and increasing uh, the amount of silica in the local silica cycle, diatoms evolving uh, due to this increase, and of course these are all things that are triggered by global climate changes. And while this record has been investigated a little bit, the studies that are out there are typically focused on the early Miocene, and there's very little pertaining to the late Miocene. And that is where I come in. So I was given a core, a core sample of a diatomite, from the late Miocene. And my main goal was to reconstruct what this environment would look like, because that's the first step of really understanding these connections. So throughout this project, my first goal was to estimate an age for this paleo lake. We know that lakes existed around this time in the grasslands of North America, but we don't really know um, how long they were there for. I also want to determine the ecologic setting of the lake. Again, I had mentioned that diatoms are phenomenal proxies for environmental conditions. So we're going to be looking at specific diatoms to see if we can get a clearer picture of what this lake was like. And I'm also going to be looking for local silica input to the lake. So this comes in the form of phytolith, the hard silica stuff that the plants were developing, um, as well as volcanic ash. So my core sample comes from Scotia, Nebraska, near the Happy Jack Chalk Mine. Um, it was drilled 15.9 feet to 26.5 feet down into the ground. So it represents 10.6 feet of lake sediment. 
And one of the things we're gonna do to determine this age is we're gonna look at the total diatom abundance throughout the core and see if this paleo lake is comparable to modern lakes. And if it is, then we'll use those sedimentation rates to kind of get an estimate for how long our lake existed. So let's talk about the diatoms we're gonna be looking at. This was my favorite part of this project. Um, the first diatom and my favorite is Stronicoviella. It is a planktonic diatom, which means it likes to float around in the top of the lake. Um, and this particular species of Stronicoviella exists only at this site. Stronicoviella itself is specific to Western North America. The second planktonic diatom we're gonna look at is Alakasaira. Again, he's floating around with his friend Stronicoviella at the top of the lake. We're also gonna be looking at some benthic diatoms like Tetracyclus. Unlike planktonic diatoms, Tetracyclus is living at the bottom of the lake along the sediments, so they aren't really floating around the top and uh, this particular species of tetracyclus, like the other diatoms, are specific to this site. Then we have Suriorella. And Suriorella is not specific to this site, but one of the reasons we're looking at it is because it exists in such a different environment from tetracyclus. And that these two diatoms really give us different perspectives of the benthic environment. So tetracyclus likes to live in clear water that's low energy, which means it doesn't like to be knocked around by a bunch of waves. It likes to just hang out on the sediments whereas Suriella doesn't mind turbid, murky waters. So what I did was I counted the total abundance of diatoms throughout the core, as well as the abundance of each of these individual core diatoms and any phytoliths and volcanic ash. And here are the results. This beautiful figure, don't be overwhelmed, we will go through it. <laughs> it's made up of six different uh, graphs put together that we then divided into separate zones that represent shifts in the lake's ecologic setting. So the first uh, graph I want to draw your attention to is the number of diatom valves per milligram of sediment. Now, this is the graph I was talking about where we just counted every single diatom we saw as opposed to the specific diatom. And you can see that there are two distinct peaks of diatom abundance throughout the core, uh, around 18 feet and at around 24 feet. Now, when comparing these numbers of diatom valves to modern lakes in Iowa, we found that it is actually comparable to modern lakes that have low to moderate productivity levels. And by productivity, I mean that things are dying, things are living, and nutrients are circulating in the lake. So the average sedimentation rate for a lake of this productivity level is about one millimeter per year which when we consider the fact that our core is 10.6 feet long, um, says that the lake should be about 3,500 years old. But this core has been compressed a lot because it has been buried since it is from the late Miocene. So we also have to take that compression into consideration. And what we did is that we took that initial 3,500 and we doubled it to make up for that compression to get a range of about 5,000 to 10,000 years that this lake was probably existed. So now we're gonna move on to the next graph. We have number of Stornicoviella per milligram of sediment. And we can see that there are two peaks of this abundance and that the bottom one seems to correlate with the total diatom abundance while the top peak is more offset. Then we have Alakasaira. One dramatic peak of Alakasaira, though it does exist significantly at the top of the core as well. And again, that bottom peak seems to be uh, correlated to that first peak along the other two graphs as well. Number of tetracyclists. There is one dramatic peak, and it's also worthy to note that tetracyclists only appears in one section of the core, whereas Alakasaira and Stronicoviella seem to kind of exist throughout of this one. And Suriorella, same thing as tetracyclist deal. It has a large peak, and it only exists in one section. Then we have amount of ash you can see that there is a dramatic amount of ash at the top of the core and that it does exist significantly at the bottom, but it also existed fairly consistently throughout the core. Maybe not as in, in a dramatic amount, but it was definitely there. And we did not observe any phytoliths. Um, and that doesn't mean that, may, that the phytoliths didn't contribute to the silica cycle. It is just possible that they had dissolved upon entering the lake and so they never got the chance to be fossilized. So now that we've walked through the graphs that make up this figure, we're gonna go through the zone. And this is gonna paint a picture of the ecologic setting of the lake. So we're gonna start at zone one because it's at the bottom of the core and therefore it was the first thing to happen chronologically. So you can see in zone one, 
we have Suriorella and we have nothing else. So the fact that Suriorella is there is telling us that the water is turbid and it's murky because it likes to live in these fine sediments. So we're saying that in zone one, this is probably the point that had the most turbid water in the lake's existence. In zone two, we have Jornicoviella and Alakasaira. And you can see that this is also the point where uh, diatom abundance really started to pick up. But we don't have any benthic diatoms. And remember, benthic diatoms live at the bottom and diatoms are photosynthesizers. So when you don't have benthic diatoms, it usually means that either the water was too deep for light to make it to the bottom, or the water was too murky. So we went ahead and we said that zone two was probably the time of the lake's existence where it had the deepest water levels because of the lack of benthic diatoms that we found. Zone three, we have Stronicoviella, a little bit of Alakasaira. Alakasaira is still present, and we have the introduction of Tetracyclus, but no Suiorella. So this introduction of Tetracyclus either means that the lake is getting shallower, allowing the light to get to the bottom, or the water is starting to become more transparent, again, allowing that light to reach the bottom. So we say that zone three, um, we have the low energy setting where tetracyclus likes to live, as well as either the lake was shallowing or the water was becoming more transparent. In zone four, we have Stronicoviella, Olicosyra, and the peak of tetracyclus. And now this peak is really important because the fact that it was able to flourish this much and the cores is in the lake's existence signifies that this was probably the period of time where the lake had the clearest amount of water and there was more light getting to the bottom of the lake. And then we have zone five, where we have volcanic ash and nothing. And there is a lot of volcanic ash. So it's very possible that a nearby volcanic eruption um, had ash carried over by the winds all over Nebraska. And um, it made the water too turbid and too murky for it to house any diatoms. Because apart from these diatoms not being present, there were no diatoms present, regardless of species at this point. And it's also possible that maybe this eruption could have terminated the existence of the lake in general. So overall, let's talk about what, we, what I did and why it's important. So we estimated the age of the Paleo Lake when comparing it to modern lakes of Iowa and compensating for the compression, uh, we determined it to be about 5,000 to 10,000 years old. Then we looked at the ecologic setting of the lake and saw that the lake was, went through different shifts and it was not a consistent ecologic setting to our existence. The water started turbid, high energy, it got deep, it got shallow or more transparent, then it was really transparent, and then a volcano doomed everyone. <laughs> and then for silica sources, uh, the only ones that we recognized was the volcanic ash, though like I said before, we can't rule out the fact that phytoliths did play an important part in this. And so that is the ecologic setting that I reconstructed this summer. And hopefully this begins the narrative for other researchers to uh, conduct more thorough studies to really find that connection between diatom evolution, development of grasslands, and global climate. So I would like to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank you, NAPCO, so, so, so much and everyone associated. This has been the greatest ex science experience ever. Uh, super awesome thank you to my research mentors who were phenomenal and taught me everything about diatoms when I knew nothing about diatoms when I got here. And uh, my communications mentor, David, who I, <laughs> the writing process was a really big part of this for me. And I wouldn't have been gotten to this point of understanding if it wasn't for the writing process. And he looked at all my drafts. Bless him. <laughs> so I will now take any questions if you have any. Yes, Patrick. Um, I was kind of curious since the volcanic ash played such an important role in the in the history of the of the lake. Did you start off knowing that? I mean, did, was there? Did you start just looking at the diatoms and then say something's going on, or did you know to look at ash from the very beginning? Um, we knew that our core sample came from the Ugalala Formation and it came from the ash hollow formation. Therefore, we assumed we would find some kind of ash in there. And uh, we did right off the bat, the very first slide that I made was just uniform ash throughout. So I didn't know at first, but then once we started doing more research on the Ugalala formation and where our core might fit in it, we assumed we would find some ash. Okay, Glenn had a question. Yeah, terrific presentation. Um, 
when you say the estimated age of the Paleo Lake uh-huh. is 5,000 to 10,000 years, is that the initial formation of the lake or is that the top of the sediment layer? What what is that age correspond to? And what's the total amount of age that the, the or total amount of time that's recorded in the sediments? Well, we actually didn't have a, an amount of time in the sediment, I mean, for the core. When we received the core, we had no idea how old it was, how long it existed. We just knew where from the earth it was taken from. So from the beginning, we, uh, we, we didn't really have an idea for age. Um, what was the first part of your question? Again? Uh, I just want to get a sense for what the absolute age of the lake is. So what period of time this is recording? Is it the last 5,000 years? Is it the last from 10,000 to 5,000 years? And you inferred the amount of time by using a sedimentation rate and the total thickness of the, of the core accommodating compaction. So I forgot, I can't remember how much time it was. You probably said it at the beginning, but. So you're saying I estimated it to be 5,000 to 10,000 years. You're saying where in that core does it fit in these 10,000 years of the lake's existence? So is that what that means? Yes. 10,000 years of time? Of time that the core, no. Of time, yes. Thank you. Uh, Teresa had a question. Well, in the same line, uh, again, great talk. So do you have a 10 feet core? Yes. So that core, you assumed uh, uniform sedimentation? Yes. And you get that core is about five to 10,000 years? Yes. Okay, so uh, you have volcanic ash. Are they dated? I mean, it's very easy to date the volcanic ash and get an absolute, very ac- accurate dating. Are, are you planning or is there any initiative? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe if my research mentor wants to keep talking to me after this, we can, we can look into that. But um, we had a very short amount of time for this research project. And actually, the project itself has shifted to what we originally thought it was going to be focused on because we had so little time we were only able to get a basic description of the paleo environment but that's totally something that could happen all right oh man coming through uh you said the you used a, a, a compression factor of 50%. Mm-hmm. Where did that number come from? The guidance of my research mentor. <laughs> <laughs> She's right here. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it's a ballpark. Ballpark. <laughs> ballpark. Yeah, just just trying to get a, an estimate of it. They, and the other part is. Uh, fractions of valves, we weren't able to get a good handle on how much is, is broken. So there's a lot to, that we could do to clarify it. Could be very variable. For everybody online, that was my research mentor, Sarah Spalding. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why Gabby was last. Um, <laughs> any other questions? So as far as your ecological, settings like the different zones is there something that is making it change like that like do you have any ideas what was going on to make the water level rise and fall um no we are not sure further investigation (laughs) is needed for that (laughs) (laughs) awesome all right uh for any more questions for Gabby or the rest of the interns, feel free to ask at lunch. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you.